Hi everyone, I'm Chris Hartley. I'm here to talk about pollinators for Nature is Not Cancelled. Pollination is a topic that most of us have heard a lot about, especially lately as we're hearing about ways to help pollinators around our homes and the troubles that several of our native pollinators are facing. So we're going to talk about all of that today, including ways that you can help pollinators around your home. So pollination happens when pollen grains are moved from the male parts of a flower to the female parts of a different flower. And here on these particular flowers, you can clearly see the pollen, those little yellow dots sticking up above the flowers. The pollen is born on the anthers of the flower. And on these particular flowers, down in the center of the flower, where it looks like all the petals kind of come together into a tube, that's where the female parts of the flower are, where the pollen must be moved to, and in most flowers where there's a nectar reward to entice pollinators to come in and move that pollen around. So that's pretty much the scheme of pollination in whichever flower you look at. Most flowers provide that nectar reward. Some don't provide a reward, but entice pollinators to do the pollination in other ways, but most do. So, at the end, pollination is kind of an agreement between flowers and the insects. The insects get food, and the flower gets pollinated. And of course, it's not always insects, though they are the main pollinators. Birds are involved in pollination in many parts of the world, especially tropical parts of the world. Bats are involved in pollination. And there are some other animals, like certain small groups of mammals that are minor pollinators as well. Then of course there are flowers that are pollinated by the wind or by the water too, but the vast majority of flowers require an animal to pollinate them. So as we talk about ways that people can support pollinators around their homes, there are many. And of course planting flowers is the first one that you need to talk about. Everything from flowering trees like the one we're looking at to any other kind of flower that you can put in. Flowers that bloom in all seasons to make sure you're providing food for pollinators in the early spring, in the summer, and in the fall are very, very important. Other important things that you can do where able are just to preserve some of the native wildflowers that are already growing in your area. Like here are some flowers that many of us might think of as weeds that can just be you know, mowed over or gotten rid of. And of course, in many cases, we have to you know, keep our yards looking nice so that we won't get in trouble with our neighbors and so that we can be proud of the home that we live in. But I always encourage people, wherever possible, wherever you have a space to let wildflowers like this grow, do so. Because they are very important for the pollinators. In fact, pollinators get a, a lot of pollen and nectar benefits from a lot of the clover and smartweed and um, dandelion and other things that we have in our yards. Other pollinator habitat, though, can be nesting sites. And I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about nesting sites today. As we go to look at some of the different kinds of bees that live in our neighborhood especially, nesting sites can include an area like what we're looking at right now. This log here, the ground, the area around the mulch, this is very important nesting site for many of the bees that live in our neighborhood. I'm going to show you um, images of what some of those bees look like in a moment. But a great many of the bees that live around here actually nest in the ground. They form these really long tunnels that go down under the ground. And they lay their eggs under there. The babies mature under there. And they'll come out to make a new generation of bees. So... Many gardeners who want to provide a service for the native bees can include areas like the one we're looking at right now in their gardens. Add a log like this, which really looks very decorative with the plants growing around it. Add some mulch and make sure you also leave um, spots of the ground unmulched too. Because those spots where you can see areas like what we're looking at now, where the mulch um, is kind of pushed aside. Now this has probably mostly been done by squirrels and whatnot digging around, to be fair. But this is an example of what 
a pollinator habitat might look like. But also, if we kind of swivel around to a more familiar lawn kind of habitat, even in an area like this, it is very possible for pollinators to live in and amongst the clumps of grass. And I haven't actually noticed any pollinator homes in this particular stretch of land. What I'm showing you more is what good pollinator home habitat might look like. But this, you know, could be someone's lawn. You know, it's not a perfectly well-kept grassy landscape, but the biodiversity here is much higher than your standard, you know, grassy landscape. And anytime you see spaces like this in between the grass, you know, that is a potential pollinator nesting site. All of these bare spaces are. Okay? So, pollinators such as these ground nesting bees can live and thrive in a great many different kinds of habitats. And spaces that you wouldn't think could support them actually do. And it's actually a lot easier to provide that kind of home for them than you might think. So, there's another more deliberate way that you can go about setting aside pollinator habitat, and that is using things like this. Pieces of bamboo, such as the one that we're looking at here, or hollow plant stems, of which there are a great many. These happen to be stems from a bee balm plant, but there's a great many other kinds of plants that you can get that are hollow inside, as you can see here. Besides the bees that nest in the ground, there's a great many other bees that actually nest inside hollow plant stems, such as this. So what many people do to create pollinator habitat around their homes is they harvest those plant stems and create little bee houses like this. This is a very simple model. It's just a simple kind of wood frame. Let me sit it down, actually, so we can get a better view at it from all sides. It's a very simple kind of wood frame. It does have a back. That's actually very important. And it's just filled with these cut hollow reeds. Some of this is bamboo, and some of it is other plants. And what those hollow spaces represent is potential pollinator nesting habitat. Okay? The bees will actually move into here, and they provision the inside of the tubes with balls of pollen that they collected from plants. They lay an egg on one of those pollen balls, and then they will move on and keep filling it up with pollen and eggs until they have you know, provisioned a whole next generation of bees inside here. Okay? Now, as I mentioned before, quite a lot of people turn to bamboo for this. Bamboo is pretty easy to get your hands on. I did want to show you one thing with the bamboo if you do use it is that you can see these ridges on the bamboo. Well, each one of those ridges on the bamboo actually goes all the way through the stem. It kind of provides like a natural wall in between the bamboo. So if you cut up pieces of bamboo to do one of these, what you actually want to do is using a saw or um, for much smaller pieces of bamboo, some nice, you know, lopping shears or something, cut kind of right behind one of these nodes and then make your other cut right behind the other node. So you'll create one end that's open like this and the other end that is closed, closed naturally by one of these, these nodes. If you can't get pieces of bamboo, not to worry. There's a great many other plants like I was showing you, plants that you probably have in your yard that have hollow stems. So you could take this, which doesn't have those nodes creating natural walls in it, but you could cut it up into pieces and then creating a box like what I showed you before, one that actually has a back on it made of wood, you could fill it full of the hollow stems and create a back for it that way. It is important to have that, that solid back, whether it's made naturally by the nesting material you're using or by a wood wall or something like that because that gives the bees kind of a starting point for where they're laying their eggs. 
and it actually can be even simpler than creating a box or constructing anything for your bee home. You could fill up a bucket that you have lying around with them. You could even just take pieces of reed and tie them together into a bundle and hang them up in a tree or um, attach them to a fence post or stick them in the rafters of a deck or something like that. Any place you can put them out is great. It's um, nice to put them near a vegetable garden or a flower garden or just to put them within sight of your house so that you can observe them and keep an eye on them and watch the bees coming to and fro. Now speaking of the bees that we might have, I wanted to show you all a few books that I have that I would encourage you all to check out if you want to learn more about bees. This one, Bees by Heather Holm. This one, The Bees in Your Backyard by Wilson and Carol. Now, both of these are going to allow me to give you a little tour of the various kinds of bees that are around here. Okay? Just so that we can see some of the, the variety of bees that there is. Okay? So, there's many, many, many different kinds of bees. Bees called cellophane and plasterer bees. There are bees called the mining bees. That's what these are, the andrena. There are bees that are called cuckoo bees. They're bees that actually don't provision a nest of their own, but kind of move into the nest of other bees. There are the sweat bees that are familiar, at least by name, to quite a lot of people. There are sweat bees that are metallic green, and these are some of my favorite bees that are in our neighborhood, just because of their fantastic colors. I think many of us don't realize that there are gorgeous green bees like this around here, but they are, and they're actually very common if you look closely in flowers for them. So there are mason bees, such as these. Now the mason bees are well known to many farmers and uh, people who run orchards because they're used in pollination services there. There's bees actually called the blue orchard mason bee. They're popular for pollinating um, orchard trees. There are wool carter bees. These bees are actually very, very interesting. Kind of looks like a yellow jacket wasp, doesn't it? But it's, it's stockier, not as, um, not as numerous, and not nearly as aggressive as yellow jackets are, so don't be confused. These are called wool carters because they actually comb the woolly hairs off of plants like lamb's ear and use them to make their nests. And then, of course, there's familiar bees like the honeybee. Notice that this book calls it the European honeybee, because the honeybee, while familiar, is not a native North American bee. Honeybees did actually come from Europe. They're still incredibly important pollinators and definitely worth um, preserving, but not actually a native bee. And then, another very familiar bee, the bumblebee. So when we talk about bumblebees, we're talking about, again, very familiar, yellow and black, very fuzzy bees, that are a familiar sight to a great many of us in our area. Okay? Bumblebees do something very, very cool. You can actually see these on these blueberry flowers and this one on this tomato flower, engaging in something called buzz pollination. And what buzz pollination means is that the bee will actually grab onto the flower as this bee is grabbed onto this tomato flower and vibrate its body very rapidly so that the pollen falls out of the flower and onto the bee. This behavior makes bumblebees the most effective pollinator of tomatoes because other bees can't effectively get the pollen out of those really weird, narrow-shaped flowers. So bumblebees are vital for the pollination of tomatoes and blueberries and other related plants, which happen to be North American native plants. Native bees for native plants work really well together. So the other thing that I wanted to show while we had this book out was some of the other nesting habitats that bees can be found in because they are really quite numerous. So bees, as I mentioned, nest either underground or in hollow plant stems. So here is some examples of what um, underground nests can look like. Okay? 
Here's another example, like some of the ones I was showing you in the area around me. Um, the bare areas around the edges of trails can be very useful to bees. Here's a female perch, perched at the entrance to her nest. Okay. But also, here's another female mining bee going underground. The area, such as in this particular park setting, um, that kind of looks bare and neglected. That's prime bee habitat. In fact, there's been some very interesting studies done in my very own city of St. Louis about how bees are thriving in abandoned lots because, precisely because they are abandoned. They're not being, you know, kept up and potentially chemically treated, and that's a bee's heaven. So, the bottom line for us who want to do more to help pollinators around our homes should be just that you can, by making very small changes, help the bees out. You don't have to transform your yard to look like that, where um, you know it looks like this park, which is like totally devoid of grass and everything else. It could actually be an area like this, as I was showing you before. You know, this is bee habitat. This is an area that could support a great many bees and do so very well. And then the more flowering plants that you can introduce into this landscape, again, keeping in mind that the more different seasons that you can cover, the better, especially paying attention to early spring and late fall when it's harder to find a diversity of plants that bloom during those times. Those are the times that are especially crucial to the bees, but also to the other pollinators. So I wanted to conclude just by talking about some of the other pollinators that you could expect to see in your neighborhood. Because besides bees, of course there's butterflies and their night flying cousins, the moths, but others that we don't often think about or pay much attention to are flies. This is a flower fly. It's a big group of flies called the flower flies. And as you can see, if I can get even closer, you can appreciate that this fly's mouth parts are actually covered in pollen, which it will move to another flower as soon as it goes to visit it. So flies are extremely important pollinators. After the bees, the general consensus is that flies are the world's second most important pollinators. I'll show you some more. These fascinating creatures are called the bee flies, mainly because many of them do resemble fuzzy bees. They also have these really elaborate mouth parts made for reaching down into flowers and getting the nectar out. And those fuzzy bodies are really well made for getting the pollen off the flowers and for moving the pollen around too. So there's bee flies, there's flower flies, there's a great many other flies that are incredibly important pollinators as well. So um, when we think of flies, we often just think of you know, house flies and flies that are an annoyance, but flies are incredibly important to the natural ecosystem and can be conserved and encouraged through um, kind of the similar ways that we're encouraging and supporting bees, planting flowers, providing natural habitats. And then a very large and important group of insects and organisms in general, the beetles are also pollinators. So here are some photos of various scarab beetles. Scarab, again, refers to a family of beetles with many, many, many different individual species in it. that are important pollinators. Many of these can be seen around here. And if you look closely at your flowers, you'll notice quite a lot of these beetles on them. Many of them resemble bumblebees in their own right. For example, this one, which is quite hairy, like a bee, but, you know, is just mimicking it, trying to gain some protection by maybe making a potential predator think it might be a stinging insect. Another family of beetles that you might find on your plants, and are pretty common in our area, are the soldier beetles. This, uh, this one right here, the orange and black fellow, is called the goldenrod soldier beetle, but it occurs on plants besides just goldenrod happens to be a very common beetle in our area for pollinating services. And then, of course, the diverse world of butterflies and moths can be encouraged by planting plants to support them and their caterpillars 
and providing homes for them throughout the year, similar to the other animals that we've been talking about today. So, I would encourage us all to think about our yards as more than just uh, pretty spaces for bringing beauty to us and to the other animals, but to think about them as you know, potential homes for the diverse pollinators that can be around us. Um, there's countless ways that you can make small changes that will add quite a lot of um, enjoyment to you and your family as you explore your yard throughout the year. You can learn more about the pollinators that live in your backyard. You can learn more about the wildflowers that can either be uh, planted and grow well in our area or that just kind of grow and pop up naturally that um, you can um, encourage and promote where you can. So um, this only scratches the surface, of course, of the world of pollinators. There's so much more to keep learning and even someone like myself who has learned a little about, about insects every day always finds that there's more out there to learn and discover.